I hope you're excited about the word. Listen, I want to encourage you, whether you're Fountain Family or Fountain Faithful, thank you once again for rocking with me this Wednesday. Lord over this church. He's the chief overseer. He is the head shepherd. Are you? He's the bishop of our souls. He is Lord, and we have to be under his authority to use his authority. And you and I are citizens of the kingdom, and our kingdom has laws and rules, and they're found right here in the scripture, which is why it's so important to have our constitution. Y'all with me? All right, rock with your boy. Hit like and share right now because, because I'm about to get in it, all right? Fountain family, what's up? It's your boy, Bishop Jaron C. O'Neill. Welcome to Rock With Me Wednesdays. I'm so excited to be here with you once again. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited about the word. I hope you are too. So go ahead and get your family gathered around. Get your Bible, get your notes and your pen and your pad. It is time for the word. I want to welcome all of our first time viewers. If you're here for the very first time, I want to send you over to the app store to download our app. It's the best way to stay connected with us. You can stay abreast of all the latest news and updates, everything that's happening at the church. We want you to be a part of it. So be sure to download it and turn on the notifications so you'll get all of the prompts. Listen, you can give that way, watch the message that way. There's a Bible on there. You can submit prayer requests. You can even join the church through the Fountain app, so be sure to download it. I also want to encourage you to like and share this broadcast. Help me be a digital evangelist. Let your friends and family know that we're on. It's time for the Word. Bishop's on Rock With Me Wednesdays, and we're going to have a great time in the Lord. So be sure to copy the link, text them, let them know it's about to go down. Uh, we're uh, actually uh, uh, broadcasting on several different uh, platforms on the Fountain app that I just told you to download. Uh, also, you can go to our website at thefountainchurch.com. Uh, you can go to Bishop O'Neill on Facebook, or you can choose Bishop Jaron O'Neill on YouTube. We're on all four platforms. If you have any challenge on one of the platforms, just go ahead and switch on over to the other. All right, and make sure the chat is live tonight. Uh, let me know that you're on there. And one way to do that is roll call, all right? Post your city, post your state, what country you're watching from. We want to see how far we're reaching. And again, your liking and sharing the broadcast helps us to reach far, okay? And so be sure to let me know what city, what state, or what country you're watching from. Even if you're watching after the live broadcast and you're watching it after it's already been recorded, go ahead and still put your city and state in so we can see how far we're impacting the world. Amen? All right. Now, listen, before we get started, we're going to bow our heads and pray, and we're going to get into this word. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we exalt you. We praise you and we bless you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence once again. I thank you for the Holy Spirit who helps me and teaches me what to say to your people. You're the architect of this church. You're the foundation of this ministry. It is you who keeps the candlestick lit here. So we thank you for sound doctrine tonight. We thank you for uh, teaching a rightly divided word to help your people understand your word so that we can obey your word. Father, we thank you that we're being drawn close and that you're anointing my mouth, that you would be in my mouth and they would hear you and not me. I yield myself to the Holy Spirit and hide myself behind your cross. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus will be magnified tonight. Be encouraged and strengthen God's people tonight and all those that feel discouraged and far from you, they're coming home tonight in Jesus' name we pray. All that agree, shout hallelujah and amen, amen. Well, family, again, I want to welcome you to Rock With Me Wednesdays. I'm Bishop Jaron O'Neill. Uh, I've got an exciting word for you tonight. Uh, those of you that have been with me, we're on a super series called Obedience, The Missing Ingredient. We've been hitting a lot of sub-series within that series, and right now we've been talking about uh, the government of the church. How do we walk in obedience as it relates to the church? The last couple of weeks, we have been dealing with the church origins, and we found out that one of the interesting things about church is it started out as a secular entity for military purposes, the ecclesia, all right, or the ecclesia uh, is what it's called in Greek. And we found out that the church originally was a secular uh, institution sent by uh, the Greeks and later Caesar to uh, 
convert and occupy and capture uh, and colonize certain areas in order to prepare that area or that region for the coming king. And so there's a lot there. So if you've not been with us, you can go back and check that out. But last week, we began to deal with the apostle and the function of the apostle and that the apostle was set to conquer and to or to capture and to occupy. And we found out that the apostle was originally originally a military uh, position in the Navy of Caesar. And one of the things that the apostle would do would, would be to conquer and occupy and plant the ecclesia or the church. And so we see Paul, you know, when Jesus, uh, you know, when he established the church uh, and sanctified it for his purposes, uh, one of those apostles that we read in Acts chapter 19, verse number 23, was Paul, who was an apostle, and he was literally capturing souls. He was in Ephesus, turning Ephesus upside down because it was the center of witchcraft. It was the center of divination and the whole economy, the culture, the livelihood was all based on witchcraft and divination. And so when Paul came in the power of the Holy Ghost doing unusual miracles, what was he doing? He was overturning their economy, overturning the region, and those people had an ecclesia. And remember when he came and they were worshiping Diana, because you remember he, you know, he was, you know, tearing people's stuff up. And there was a woman who was there who was a, a medium and a soothsayer, and uh, her masters had made great profit off of her. We also see when they ended up burning all of their witchcraft and occult books because of Paul. And then in Acts chapter 19, he goes in there and no one can sell their idols because no one believes in their idols or Diana because of Paul's uh, powerful work there. And so what was happening? People were getting saved. They were being converted. They had been captured by the love of Jesus. Somebody say amen. That's what happens. We're captured by the love of Jesus. And he brought them into his ecclesia. And in Acts chapter 19, it says that they brought Paul before their secular ecclesia. So we literally saw the gates of hell trying to prevail against God's church. And so this was one of the acts of the apostles. So the apostle, again, was there to capture and to occupy. And then we also begin to see that in Ephesians 4, 8, when it talks about how Jesus led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and how he ascended on high, gave gifts unto men after he led captivity captive. Well, we found out the reason that it says that Jesus led captivity captive is because Jesus was the first apostle. So not only did Paul, um, you know, capture and occupy, we find out that Jesus, he captured and he occupied, right? And so he captured, he captured uh, uh, us from our sins and he took captives. That's why the Bible says he led captivity captive because he took captives. He snatched them out of the hands of Satan and then he occupied our heart. And that's what he's doing. Amen. And so uh, this was actually a foreshadow in the Old Testament that was fulfilled by Jesus. Amen. And this was something I got a chance to uh, teach in Las Vegas and didn't get a chance to teach here in California. And I, I've heard that Las Vegas Refreshing Waters is on with us tonight. So I want to give a big shout out to uh, Pastor Farrell and Prophetess Lola uh, and all the Refreshing Waters, amen, that is here with us tonight. Praise God for you. All right. So, so again, Ephesians 4, 8, where it says uh, that Jesus ascended on high, led captivity captive, and then he gave gifts to men. We dealt with that last week. Let's move forward and let's consider uh, what we have been talking about. Psalm 68 and 18 is actually the Old Testament reference of that uh, passage that Paul uh, was quoting. Uh, so, and what we found is that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament, this Old Testament passage in Psalm 68. Let's turn there. We talked about it last week. We'll pick up right there. Psalm 68, verse number 18. It says, thou hast ascended on high. I'm reading out of the Darby Bible because this has the appropriate translation. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts in man. Remember we talked about it wasn't just uh, gave gifts to men. It's received gifts in man. And even who? For the what? Rebellious for the dwelling there of Yah Elohim. So God led captivity captive. This was Paul, uh, this, excuse me, David doing it in this passage. But it was a prophetic foreshadow of what Jesus would do when he ascended on high. So this is a prophetic foreshadow of uh, what Jesus would do when he ascended to heaven. The event is a prophesied in Psalms. Stay with me. The event was prophesied in Psalms. It was recounted in Ephesians, 
But we actually see it happen in the book of Acts, where Jesus ascended on high, put gifts in men, right? He led captivity captive, ascended on high, and gave gifts in men. We'll see it in the book of Acts. Again, it's prophesied in Psalms, which we just read, recounted in Ephesians 4, 8, but actually lived out in Acts chapter 1. We talked about it last week. Let's check it out. Let's actually read the scriptures. Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. This is right before uh, Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. Uh, remember, once Jesus got up from the grave and after he put the blood on the mercy seat, he came back. Come on, he came back. Somebody say he came back. He hung out for 40 days and presented himself to the disciples and to over 500 people at one time. Many people saw Jesus. He was on tour after his resurrection. Come on, somebody say he was on tour. <laughs> so so peop- there were a lot of eyewitnesses. It wasn't just a couple of people. It wasn't just the disciples. No, he presented himself to hundreds of people. Okay, and so it was a known thing. And and the Bible says he did many infallible proofs to show that he was alive from the dead. And so this is what happens right after he's done all these wonderful works after getting up from the grave. And verse number nine, it says, and when he had spoken these things while they watched, this is referring to Jesus. Uh, when Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. A cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, somebody say this same Jesus, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come so in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Underline that in your Bible because it's very clear or very important to understand that the same way that they saw Jesus go up is the same way he's coming back. So if he came back in the clouds where everybody could see him, or if he left that way, he's coming back that way. He's not going to be in the desert. He's not going to be under the sea. He's not going to be, you know, in some cave. No, no, he's coming back the same way that he left. All right. So this is when Jesus had ascended on high. So I want you to get here after he got up from the grave. And remember in Matthew 27, 51, he got up with a lot of people. Those were the captives of Satan. Those that were in Abraham's bosom and those that would have given their life to Jesus. He then took them on to heaven, right? So he led captivity, captive, and the Bible says he ascended in a cloud. Now, I believe that that was an actual cloud. But also remember in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, where it talks about all the patriarchs of our faith, uh, all from Moses to, uh, uh, to Abel uh, to Joshua. They're all listed. All these great men of faith, right, are listed in the scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. When you get to Hebrews chapter 12, it says, since we are now surrounded by such a what? Great cloud of what? Witnesses. So there was the actual clouds that he ascended in, but there was another cloud of believers that were being led. They were captives and he led them as he ascended on high. Do you see that? He was actually ascending on high and took all the people that he had rescued from hell, the ones who died before he died on the cross. He had to go down and preach to them and take them into heaven. Isn't that powerful? Jesus didn't forget anybody. Amen. So anyone that's going to hell had to actually reject the gospel and reject that he was the son of God. No one that is in heaven, no one that is in hell, uh, uh, can say that they did not have an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because, again, he preached to the dead. We talked about that last week. If you weren't with us, go back, all right, and check out the message. So he went and ascended in the actual clouds, but there were also a great cloud of witnesses. Then, right after that, Jesus, the Bible says he would give gifts to men or gifts in men, according to Psalms uh, 68, verse 18 in the Darby version, uh, that he would give gifts in men. So what was the next thing that happened after Jesus ascended? Well, remember, they go to the upper room. The disciples go to the upper room with all of the disciples, uh, the women and Mary and, and Jesus' mother. And the Bible says it was 120 of them. And what are they waiting on? They're waiting on the promise. But while they're there praying for several days, look at what happens in Acts chapter 1, still in the same chapter, verse number 21. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us from beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. What are they talking about? 
Well, remember, Judas hung himself because he betrayed Jesus. So there's no longer 12 apostles. There's 11. So while they're praying, waiting on the coming of the Holy Spirit during their time of prayer, look at what it says. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabas, uh, who was a uh, surname justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in the ministry. And what does it say? Apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place that they can. And they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias and he numbered and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So isn't it interesting that since Jesus ascended or led captivity, uh, ascended, led captivity captive, then he gave gifts and men. The next thing that happens after Jesus ascends into heaven, there's an apostleship. What's less is no, he released the gift and the mantle that he had and the anointing fell upon Matthias and Matthias took the apostleship left vacant by Judas. And so we have the fulfillment of the scripture prophesied in Psalms, recounted in Ephesians and actually happened in the book of Acts. Are you with me? So praise God for that. So Jesus will put a gift in a man. Look at this specifically for rebellious people to make them a dwelling place because that's what we read. He says he will put gifts in men for the rebellious to make a dwelling place for the Lord God. Amen. So key point I have for you here, the gift that Jesus gave are specifically to teach obedience to people. The gifts that Jesus gave when he led captivity captive after he ascended and gave gifts to men, that gift is to capture people so that Jesus can occupy people. So the mantle that he released is an apostolic mantle and an apostolic mantle is to capture, occupy and assimilate for the coming of the king. So all the gifts that Jesus gave, which is recounted in what? Ephesians 4, 8 through 11, right? Or actually further down than that is to what? Teach people obedience. Let's turn there now. Ephesians 4 and 11. Uh, we got some things to go through in a little bit of time. So rock with your boy. All right. Ephesians 4 and 11. Go ahead and hit like and share because uh, we're going to get into some things that uh, will dismantle some myths about the leadership of church. Uh, Ephesians 4 and 11, let's read it together. It says, and he gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Read verse 12 with me for the what? Perfecting, circle that word perfecting. Perfecting of the saints, all right? The perfecting of the saints. I, I'd like to retitle this message today, the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting of the saints. For the what work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till what we come to, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more what? Children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. Come on, give the Lord a hand praise for the reading of his word. So we see here that God gave the apostle, uh, the, the uh, prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, which we call the fivefold ministry gifts. He gave those as the governments of his church. And the number one thing they're supposed to do is somebody say, perfect the saints for the work of the ministry so they can edify the body of Christ. That word perfecting is the Greek word kartismas, katartismas, katartismas. It's, it's, it means to complete furnishing, to complete furnishing. It means the fitting or preparing fully or preparing it to fit. That's what perfecting means to complete the furnishing. And it means the fitting or preparing fully or preparing it to fit somewhere. The root of that word is katar titso. Katar titso. And it means complete, to complete thoroughly, to repair, or 
literally or figuratively, to adjust. It means to complete thoroughly, to repair, or to adjust. All right? So that's what katar titso means, to adjust, to repair, or to complete thoroughly. That word in Matthew 4.21, katar titso, is used when they are talking about mending their nets. When the disciples, remember their nets broke with all the fish, and so they would mend their nets. It's the same word, katar titso. Uh, when the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 3 that we know by faith that the world's uh, were, uh, were framed by words, right? That word frame, which means repair, it's the same Greek word, katar titso. Katar titso is where we get the word cauterize from. Cauterize. Uh, you know in the medical field, uh, there's a term called cauterize when there is a wound and they will use heat or fire to stop the bleeding or to stop the wound. I have a picture here of what cauterize is to help you understand. Uh, those of you who may be in the same, in a different field uh, called uh, construction, uh, or, you know, sometimes when they're doing repair on technical things like computers, uh, they will use something called um, soldering. Soldering, when they're taking heat and then melting something so that, you know, it is repaired. So when you say the word katar titso, I want you to think in your mind of a man of God or the Lord using a cauterizing instrument to stop the wounds, to heal the bleeding, to adjust, to repair, to mend, and put back together again. Amen. Does that make sense? So that's what the word katar titzo. Uh, in the Thayer's uh, Greek uh, dictionary, uh, Thayer's, it says of the word cauterize or to katar, katar titzo means ethically to strengthen, to perfect, to complete. And I love this. It says to make one what he ought to be. The purpose of Qatar so is to make one what he ought to be. So based upon the scripture we just read in Ephesians 4.11, that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are given as a gift by God, by Jesus, when he uh, ascended on high, he left people to Qatar Titso, your life. So the key point I have for you is the fivefold ministry is here to help you become what you ought to be what you ought to be. Rock with your boy, we're going somewhere. So you have work to do. The Bible says perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You have work to do. Come on, type it in the chat. I've got work to do. I've got work to do that will edify. Edify means to build up the body of Christ. You're not just in the body of Christ. You're there to help build up the body of Christ. Are you with me? The body of Christ is waiting for you to grow up. The body of Christ is waiting for you to adjust and be repaired so that you can do your part in the body. Remember in the body of Christ, it says that every joint supplies. So you cannot supply anything to the body unless you have something to supply. Rebellious people can't supply anything. Rebellious people in the body of Christ will only be a cancer. They're, they're like arthritis in the joints. Are you with me? They only cause pain. I hear you, Holy Ghost. They only cause pain and discomfort in the body. Right? But when you have been katar titso, cauterized by the Holy Ghost, by the fivefold ministry gifts, you can supply and edify and build up the body the way that God wants you to do it. But you have to go through the process of being katar titso by the fivefold ministry gifts that God has set over your life so you can become what you ought to be. Not what your life made you, not what trauma turned you into, not what abandonment turned you into. No, what God wanted you to be from the very beginning. And the Holy Ghost has anointed men and women of God in your life, listen to me, to help you become what he always intended. So they got their cauterizing instrument out right now. Now, and notice that you can't cauterize without fire. But listen, the Bible says, is not his word a fire? Listen, so we're going to use the fire of the word of God to help cauterize you and heal the wounds so you won't be a wound. No, you can help the wounded. You can help those that have been uh, hurt, those that have been traumatized. And God will use you in the very area that he healed you in to reconcile others to him. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand praise right there. 
Hallelujah. So look at this here. Your pastor, based upon what we've read here of what kartartsitzo means, your pastor is here to mend, repair, adjust, kartartsitzo you so that you become habitable, right? Because he gave gifts in men for the rebellious to be a dwelling place for God. The interesting thing about this word katartzo, it's the same word in Hebrews 10:5 when the Bible says that God did not desire sacrifices, so he made a body for Jesus. He says he prepared a body for Jesus. That word prepared in Hebrews 10:5 is the same word katartzo, which means Listen, I don't want any more sacrifices, so I'm going to prepare and adjust a body to put my spirit in, and he's going to be my son. Even Jesus had to be catartizo. So if Jesus, I uh, thank you, Holy Ghost, catch this. Uh, I think about my, my house that I live in right now. When my wife and I first uh, were looking for a home, we kept getting outbid for every home. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. Uh, this is back in like 2018. And so we found a house. It was in the right neighborhood. It had the right amount of bedrooms and bathrooms uh, for our large family. And it was right in the price range I wanted to spend. Matter of fact, it was under the price range, so you know I liked it. And so I went to go see the house. And when we walked in the house, you ever meet people that are good people? I'm sure they're good people. They just have different standards and definitions of what clean is. Different standards and definitions of what clean is. And so I realized that they, uh, they didn't have the same boundaries that I have for their dog. And so they had a bull mastiff, which is a very large dog. If you know anything about dogs, uh, I'm not a dog whisperer myself, but I've learned a few things about dogs. And so the dog was all through the house. And, you know, uh, the kids didn't really have, um, they, didn't, they didn't have the same cleaning days that we had. So, so the bathrooms were, the tubs were black. Everything was a mess. The floor was a mess. Everything in the house was a mess. The colors were ugly. The kitchen had grease all over the cabinets. It was a mess. So when we walked in there, I'm looking, look at, look, look at, I'm, I'm looking at the bones of the house. I'm looking at, as a visionary because I'm, I'm apostolic by nature. You know, I build, you know. And so I, I'm, I'm walking around the house thinking, okay, got five bedroom, five bath, okay. Uh, pool, all right, solar panels, uh, okay, nice size kitchen and all that. My wife, though, says, this is not habitable for me. I, I, I cannot dwell here right? I, can, I cannot dwell here. And so uh, she's, you know, she's walking in there, you know, and I, and I, I spoiled her real good. I take real good care of her. And so um, this was one of the smallest houses we've lived in. You know, she's used to certain size closets and, you know, uh, but this one, this is what was available and we could get this one and I could get it at a steal, right? Um, so I walked out, I said, babe, I think, I think we can do this one. She said, oh, no, no. She said, if you live there, you're going to be living there by yourself. I said, girl, you're going to be right here with your husband. That's what you're going to do. I said, don't look at what you see because I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. I said, you know what I do? I know some people. I'm about to cut tar titso this place. Are you with me? And so I went in, gutted. I said, don't even show up. Just, just let me get the plan together. Let me get the resources together. And so we got the house uh, you know, got it at a great price, had everything we needed. I said, just don't even show up till I'm done. You just tell me what you want. So she chose all the colors and all, you know, she did her wife thing and I'm going to do my apostolic thing. And that is Qatar Titso. So I went in there, got rid of all the bathrooms, got rid of the, the floors. We tore out everything, the kitchen, everything. And God blessed us. We were so grateful. God blessed us to have the resources to be able to uh, make the house habitable for my wife. So when she came in, she said, oh my goodness, all right, you did your thing, sir. And so God bless, God blessed us. And my wife lives there. I remember when we first took our kids there, they were still looking, yeah. I said, y'all, y'all all spoiled. You need a good husband. That's what you need. And so, uh, but what I did, I got rid of everything. I, I was doing what? I was repairing. I was mending. I was adjusting. I was perfecting thoroughly so that it could be, listen to me, it could be a dwelling place. Are you listening? So, so the same way that my wife was looking at that house, along with all my children, were looking at that house, is the same way, li listen to me, that, that Jesus is looking at your house. 
He sees he's, you've invited him in, but he came in the house. He sees old morals, <laughs> old attitudes, uh, old defeating personality traits. Are you with me? Old unethical behavior and uh, questionable ethics. Are you with me? He sees rebellion and anger and malice and that get back in the inability to be in relationship with you because, you know, folks got to live with you. You know what I'm saying? And so what he does is he says, okay, I'm living here, but I need you to go to this church and submit your life. I've got an apostle there, a pastor there, a prophet there, a fivefold ministry gift that has been assigned to cauterize you, to cut to cut our tits so your life and move all that stuff out in the same way I had to tear out the bathrooms and the kitchen and the floor it's the same way he's going to tear all that old behavior and the old you out come on to make you what you ought to be so you can be a dwelling place because Jesus does not want to live with your old mess See, we're forcing God. See, he loves us, and we're to come him, to him as we are, but we're not supposed to stay as we are. You have to submit so you can be cauterized. See, this is the danger of the philosophy or the bad doctrine of, oh, I can be saved and I don't have to go to church. But the person who cauterizes is at the church. He says, I have set first in the church apostles, prophets, and what? Teachers. They're in the church. So, see, th that's the thing. The body of Christ is not just the physical building, but the governments are at the church. The apostle's not at your house. And this is why you have people that are reading their Bible, but they've never been cauterized. They're still wounded, and the bleeding won't stop. Rock with your boy. Go ahead and hit like and share. I'm on my way to your house. Amen? Jesus does not want to live with your miss, so he assigned ministry gifts to help you clean up. They are there to help you mend, repair, and restore with the Word of God. Uh, did you know that the word kartizo is also translated restore in Galatians 6.1? So not only is it mend, not only is it repair, it's also restore. He restoreth my soul. Well, how does he restore it? He sends someone to cauterize. Catch this, and they do this. How do we do this? How do we cauterize? Not with our opinion, not with our feelings, not with, oh, well, I think they need this. No, we do it with the Word of God. The Word of God comes in there, and it is a light and a lamp. It is a it is a hammer, it is a sword, and it's going in and doing the work. And you need anointed men and women of God assigned to your life to help you do the work. Are you with me? Key point here is sound doctrine draws new boundaries. Sound doctrine draws new boundaries. What does that mean? See, your old boundaries allowed you to cuss. It allowed you to drink, allowed you to lie, allowed you to go off, allowed you to stonewall for two weeks with your husband or your wife. Your old boundaries allowed you, uh, you know, to do the silent treatment. Your old boundaries uh, uh, told you how to withhold. Your old boundaries told you, to say, well, they did this to me. I'm going to do this back to them. Eye for an eye. Uh, the, your old boundaries said, listen, don't make me mad. You're going to meet the old me. <laughs> right, right. That, that's what the old you do. But the new doctrine says, uh, there's, a new, there's a new sheriff in town. We're doing a new rule writing session. And that is not okay in the kingdom of God. The Bible says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. And you used to be fast with your mouth. But if you sit up under the word, under a teacher who would tell you, hold on, that's not what the word says. You don't get to do what you want and say you belong to Jesus. No, it's katar titso. Somebody say the perfecting of the saints. The word will adjust you. This whole obedience series will give you a new attitude adjustment. We didn't dealt with everything from family to marriage to the workplace to civil governments, and now we own the church. This series is an attitude adjustment. It'll cauterize you. The Word will not only make you a dwelling place spiritually, but it will make you uh, uh, hab uh, uh, habitable personally. What, is, what does that mean? See, we, a lot of times, well, we want Jesus to live in us. Yeah, that's one thing, but you got to be someone that people can live with. People got to live with you. They got to go to work with you. They got to do life with you. And if your attitude is never adjusted, if you've never been corrected, you are not easy to live with. You don't want your spouse or your family or your friends to spend their, all their faith just trying to stay with you. Because nobody can tell you anything. No, let somebody come and cauterize, cauterize, catartizo, right? So, so check this, fivefold governments have to make practical adjustments practical adjustments 
are you with me, that deal with everyday life, that deal with your character, that deal with your, somebody say character, character. You know, as I was studying the word katar titso, uh, which means the perfecting, right, which is where we get the perfecting of the saints. Did you know, key point here, katar titso indicates the close relationship between character and destiny, between character and destiny. See, there's lots of rebellious people looking to fulfill purpose and destiny without ever changing. And God, listen to me, uh, God does not take people to purpose that are rebellious. He does not bring people to destiny that cannot follow instructions. Who are you going to help in your set place and you can't be told anything? Because, right, because he says, uh, perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Who are you going to build up and you didn't allow anybody to build you? If you never built character, if you never built patience, if you never built long suffering in the fruit of the spirit, if you never uh, built up, you know, tolerance for, for, for different difficult situations and how to uh, restrain your anger, are you with me? How to, how to be angry and not sin. If, you, if that was never built in you, how are you going to build in the body of Christ? It's not going to happen. You cannot undergo the process of katartizo without being teachable and obedient. And this is why God requires obedience to his government. Hebrews 13 and 17. We're almost out of time. Let's, let's, let's get moving here. Hebrews 13 and 17. This is why God requires obedience because you, you, you cannot go through the process of being cauterized in the kingdom without being teachable and being obedient. Read Hebrews 13 and 17 with me. King James Version says, Obey them that have what? Rule over you. Who is it talking about? The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, right? The pastor. These fivefold ministry gifts. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. Underline that in your Bible. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So you're supposed to submit yourselves to the leadership of your church. Are you with me? Of your church because they watch for your soul and they have to give an account to God for how they shepherded you and how they taught you. So God expects you to submit yourselves to your church leadership. Here's the key point I have for you. No one can make you submit. You have to submit yourself. You have to submit yourself. Notice every time it talks about submit, it says submit yourself. So, so submission is not something I'm forcing anyone to do. I'm not forcing my wife to submit. She has to submit herself. Submission is in the power of the one submitting. It's in the hand of the one submitting. We hear the word submit and we think control, but no, the Bible could not mean control because it said submit yourself. Go on, type in the chat. I'm going to submit myself. See, when you join a church, you are submitting your life to the leadership of that church. Let me say that again. When you join a church, you're not just joining because they got a great worship team and the word was encouraging. No, you're submitting your life to the leader of that church. You're saying, I'm going, I can be cauterized here. I can catartizo here. You're submitting your life to the leadership. They are going to challenge you. They're going to challenge your old ways. They're going to challenge uh, your old behavior, uh, the old rules that you live by. They're going to come in there and mess your book up. The way that you used to talk to your wife or your husband, the leader of that church is, is anointed to preach a word that's going to vex you. Every word is not designed to encourage you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Oh, I'm trying to find a church that fits my personality. Well, then you're at the wrong church. If it fits the personality you currently have, you're at the wrong church. Now, I'm going to teach some words that's going to really encourage you. I'm going to teach some words that's really going to empower you and equip you. And some words are going to challenge you and might tick you off. The Bible says the truth will set you free. If you know the truth and the truth will set you free. But I have found that the truth generally makes you mad before it sets you free. You ever heard somebody really tell you the real truth? Your real friend tells you the real truth. And I'm here to be your real friend today. Somebody need a real friend? Listen, your rebellious nature is going to want to rise up and reject authority and get familiar with authority. See, huh, you, you, you have to choose to stay submitted because you submit yourself. 
I can't make you submit. But what happens when I challenge you, uh, when Prophet Lola or uh, Pastor Farrell challenges you, when one of the elders comes and challenges you, you're in a counseling session, they say you are wrong for that and you need to cut that out or you're going to mess up your whole life or lose your whole family. Hey, you, hey, you were wrong for that. Hey, but li- that flesh is going to rise up. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. You, you a man just like me. You put on your pants the same way. Oh, oh, now I'm a man just like you. But when you agreed with me, I was the anointed man of God. I was Elijah in your life. As long as you agreed, as long as I was tickling the bottom of your feet. But when it's time to wash your feet, when it's time to cauterize, you just a man. Here, here, here's a key point. Key point here, your submission is not tested until you disagree. Your submission is not tested until you disagree. You have to choose to stay submitted. Everybody is submitted until they disagree. But you can choose to yield even when you think you're right. You have to learn to yield and stay submitted even when you think you're right. It's easy to get offended, feel misunderstood, and get up and leave a church. Oh, God called me here. Oh, I, I, I saw you in a vision. God called me here. I'm never going to leave you, Bishop. I'm never going to leave you, leave you, Pastor. I'm never going to leave you, Prophet. Oh, oh, you the watchman over my soul until you disagree. Then all of a sudden, God seemed to change his mind about your call to that church the moment that you got in a cauterizing session. So you don't realize your attitude is actually a wound. You don't realize your anger issue is actually a wound that God has sent the man and woman of God to cauterize you either in a counseling session, one-on-one, or over the word through his Holy Spirit to cauterize that because you got that anger from a wound in your life. You think it's just a part of your personality, but it's actually a wound that's bleeding that will keep you from your destiny because God said, katartizo, ties together character and destiny. Let me say this last thing to you. You may feel your leader sometimes is wrong and leaders can make mistakes. You may feel that your leader missed it. And I found that a lot of times when leaders make mistakes, people will rise up and say, oh, you were wrong. And listen to me, uh, uh, they'll see that their leader is wrong and therefore they lost the right to say anything to you. They lost the right to say anything to you. But, But here's what I have for you. Just because a leader made a mistake does not mean they forfeit their authority. Oh, this is heavy. This is heavy. See, this is a principle. See, and remember, obedience is a principle. It's not a feeling. It's not based on how you feel about your leader at that moment. It's a principle. See, because you're not obeying them because of them being perfect. You're obeying them because of the office that they sit in. See, the president can make a lot of mistakes, but guess what he still is? The president. Your teacher can be wrong, but try to run up on your teacher. As a parent, do parents make mistakes? Absolutely, parents can make mistakes. But because your parent made a mistake does not mean you get to rise up and be familiar and equal with them because they made a mistake. Oh, I'm wrong, but I'm still your daddy. Don't lose. And see, but we don't keep that same principle when it comes to spiritual leadership. We will stick at jobs that do us wrong and treat us bad and and skip over us for promotion and we'll stay there 20 years. But if your pastor has a problem or somebody in the leadership or even a department leader that you don't like, you will leave in 20 seconds and say, God didn't call me there. I'm out. I'm going to the next church. But you're going to the next church bleeding and that same issue is there keeping you from your destiny and God is saying, you still got to be cauterized. You can be cauterized here or you can be cauterized there. And I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to be quiet. There's a lot of people that have left churches and you think you have a new pastor. You got a new pastor on your app. You got a new pastor on your little profile. But in heaven, the pastor that God sent you to a while back is still your pastor. And God's saying you're not going nowhere else till you go back there and get cauterized. We're going to give the Lord a hand praise right there. I'm out of time. Father, we thank you, Lord. For this word, we thank you, Lord, that you are coming to cauterize us. We thank you for the adjustment. We thank you for the repair. We thank you for the mending. We thank you that you're teaching us the principle of obedience. And we repent 
for obeying when we feel like it. Obedience is a principle. You said obey those that have rule over you, and you have set your church as a military operation to go and get those that are rebellious and make them a habitation. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are uh, making us where you can live in us. We don't want you to tiptoe around the mess in our house, the dirty tubs, the dirty floors, the dirty attitudes, the dirty thought life. We don't want you to tiptoe around it. We want you to burn it out by the fire of the Holy Ghost. So we submit ourselves to your word and to your leadership. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, if you were blessed by that word, come on, give the Lord a hand praise. I want to give those of you that are listening to me uh, that don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you want to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to receive him. You can do so by repeating the prayer of salvation after me now. Say it with me. Dear Lord, I come before you, and I realize that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. So I put my faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross and the blood he shed washed away my sins. I believe that Jesus got up from the grave with all power in his hands. And I thank you, Lord, that he's coming back again. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Teach me to live for you. I thank you that I'm saved by confession of my faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Praise. Family, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you are saved. And I want to welcome you to the family of God. You are a new creation. And it is so important for you now to get connected with the Bible believing and teaching church so you can enter into the perfecting process where God can begin to cauterize the wounds that you picked up before you knew him. So I'm going to encourage you to go to the app that I told you to download and go to the prayer request tab and fill out the prayer request form. Give us your name. I've got a team that's anointed. That's, they're going to call you back, pray with you, and tell you what your next steps are. Amen. Let's praise God for those that just gave their life to Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God for you. Family, before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to sow into the house. Amen. Help me continue to get the gospel out. Your faithful giving, tithing, and offering. Tithe is 10% of whatever God's blessed you with. Offering is whatever God just prompts your heart to do. I thank you for your faithful sowing in this ministry. We want to get the gospel out, and God's doing amazing things here. We've got a lot to do in the kingdom, in our community, as well as the world abroad, and your giving helps us to do that. So we have several ways that you can look right there on your screen. Number one way to give is through Givelify. Amen. You can download that app. Choose the Fountain Church in Pomona. You'll know because you see my face. And you can give through tithe offering or uh, because you're watching online, be sure to choose the online or the broadcast uh, uh, tithe and offering so we know it's coming from our virtual uh, ministry or the broadcast ministry, okay? So be sure uh, because our Bible study is completely online. Choose the broadcast option. Uh, you can also do that. So on Subsplash on the app, do the same thing through the broadcast option. And then uh, you can also give on the fountainchurch.com uh, if you want to do it that way. And then, of course, those of you that may be far and want to write a check, uh, you can write your checks to the Fountain Church. All right. The Fountain Church or just the Fountain. And you can mail it to 1100 East Holt Avenue, Pomona, California, 91767. Listen, I thank you once again for your faithful support of this ministry. Amen. Uh, those that are partners from all over the world in different states, we thank you for your gift, and I want to pray and bless you now. So lift up your offering, uh, reach your hand towards the screen, or put up your phone emoji. I want to bless you now. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we glorify you, we exalt you, we praise you. I bless your people. I thank you, Lord, that they're faithful, and one of the ways that they walk in obedience is through their giving. It shows that we keep you first. Father, you don't need our money, but you do want our heart. And you said where our treasures lie, that our heart will be also. So, Father, we're giving you not just money. We're giving you our heart. We're saying that we trust you no matter the economy, no matter what is happening on the news, no matter about fear of war. We are in your hands, and you are protecting your people. Uh, we're protecting those of us that are in California, those that are in Arizona, those that are all over the world and also to our Las Vegas church. Father, we pray blessing and provision for your people. We shall live and not die, and we shall prosper in everything we put our hands to. In Jesus' name, all that agree, shout hallelujah and amen. All right, family, just before we go, you know what to do. Stay connected with your boy. Go to my website, jarenconeal.com, and you can get all of my messages. Uh, I had a young man tell me I had over 600 messages on there. All right, so I've got 600 messages that you may not have heard. You can go back and check them out. 
Uh, Download Club Plus is the best way to do it because for $30 a month, you get access to all 600 and all the ones coming forward. Yes, I'm letting you rob me. So go ahead and get that word and get cauterized, okay? You can also get a bunch of free messages on JCO Podcast on several different platforms. And so I think it'll definitely be a blessing. I want you to be sure to log on for Bible study with Pastor Mitch. I got a spiritual son out there in Arizona doing a great work out there. 6 p.m. tomorrow, he'll be on for Bible study. A great word. Amen. So be sure to check him out. And tonight, I'm going to be on God TV. God has opened up a door for international TV. It's on Direct TV. It's on uh, you know, Apple TV, Roku, um, God TV website, and God, t- God TV app. Uh, I'll be on tonight at 9.30 p.m. As, uh, and then, of course, every Sunday at 12.30 p.m. So be sure to check that out. Um, we're excited about that. And be sure to log on this Sunday at 10 a.m. for Sunday broadcast or be in the house. We've got an awesome word and an awesome time this entire weekend. So be sure to be here at 10 a.m., I love you so much. Also, one special announcement. We have a resurrection play that uh, I want to get done, and I want it to be super powerful, and I want to be able to put it on God TV. So we need people to come out and audition for the resurrection play. It is a powerful play. Uh, I forget the exact name of it, but I know it's about the return of Jesus Christ, and it talks about end times, and it's going to be amazing. So you know we've got an awesome uh, arts program here. And so we want you to be a part. So if you think you're a thespian, thespian, I want you to come on and be on out. And, uh, the team is going to let you know, uh, whether, what, what part of the play you're going to be in, or, uh, they want you to keep on praying. Amen. They just want, Hey, we want you to pray for the play. All right. Listen, come on and be a part. I love you so much. You heard this word family. Now let's go do it. Peace. Thank you.